What if I do my whole lecture like this? Half my face. Y'all probably don't look anyway. Y'all probably are just listening to me, which is good. Do it. Do whatever you have to do. So, chapter 26. Second time. So, um, this chapter, guys, is basically just about concepts of basic nutrition and cultural considerations. Please remember when we're talking about cultural uh, considerations, I know I've said this a million times, it's not saying everybody within the culture. It's just saying that that is what is noted mostly um, in that culture. So let's go ahead and do a quick little overview on the structures involved in the digestive system. That's the mouth, teeth, tongue, uh, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestines, large intestines, and the anus. And then we're going to also speak about the accessory glands or accessory organs. And that's the salivary gland, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Um, where are my glasses, y'all? There they go. Okay, so uh, please make sure that you note figure 26-1. Um, what I want you to know is what is composed of the gastrointestinal system, which is what I just named just a few seconds ago. The mouth, tongue, teeth, pharnace, esophagus, uh, stomach, small intestine, large intestines, um, and anus, and that you understand that the accessory organs are the gallbladder, the liver, the salivary glands, and the pancreas. My glasses are a bit dirty, guys. Hold on. Now let's talk about the function of the organs of digestion. Okay, let's start with the mouth. Of course, we know the mouth is the first part of the digestive tract. Okay, that's a little bit better. Um, it contains the teeth and receives secretions from the salivary glands. And the mouth uh, receives the food and it breaks it down into the smaller particles and it mixes the food with the saliva and that is the start of the digestive process. The parotid glands, which is the um, largest salivary gland, you have one on each side and is located anterior and inferior to the ear. It secretes salivary, uh, saliva into the mouth and it begins digestion in of starches. So remember that. So um, what I want you to highlight and make a note of is the salivary, uh, I'm sorry, the saliva in the mouth um, initiates the digestion of starches. I need you to highlight it, make a note, draw hard to do whatever you need to do. Um, the pharynx acts as the passageway for food to enter into the esophagus and the esophagus is the pathway for food from the mouth to the stomach and it also secretes mucus to ease passage of the food. Um, now let's talk about the stomach. The stomach is a temporary place of food storage. It churns and it mixes the food with the gastric juices into the uh, semi-liquid state which begins digestion of the protein. Okay, I'm telling you all the differences on what um, initiates digestion of which thing. Also, the stomach absorbs vitamin B12 through acts of the intrinsic factor, um, which secretes uh, from the stomach wall. Please make a note of this, an age-related variance or an age-related problem with the esophagus is the esophageal sphincter tone. It can lead to a patient having difficulty with reflux and I want you to know that reflux is what we call heartburn. So the function of the um, organs, once we start talking about the different ports, we're gonna continue with that. The small intestine is what receives food from the stomach and secretions from the liver and the pancreas. And the digestion is finished in the small intestines. Nutrients are absorbed and residue is then passed into the large intestines. The large intestines absorb fluid and electrolytes and it stores waste until evacuation from the anus. The liver produces and secretes bile into the small intestines for digestion of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins through its metabolic factors and functions. The gallbladder stores and concentrates bile. 
fatty foods in the duodenum stimulates flow of bile into the duodenum via the common bile duct. The pancreas secretes digestive juices into the small intestines via the common bile duct for digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. The pancreas secretes insulin into the bloodstream for utilization of glucose. Now there is some, um, oh my gosh, these glasses are giving me a fit, guys. But there are some um, effects of aging on the GI tract that we're going to talk about here now. So, dental caries and teeth loss um, can happen due to the effects of aging and this can decrease a person's ability to food, to chew their food. Um, also with that being said, then you have some patients who wear um, dentures and ill-fitting dentures can also decrease the ability for them to chew food. And then we have the decreased gag reflex and this can increase the risk of aspiration. And we have the decrease of taste. And when they have the decrease of taste, then they can have also a loss of appetite. Um, some aging patients may have decreased muscle tone in their sphincter like we discussed. Um, they have an increased uh, esophageal uh, reflux, which is heartburn. They can have decreased gastric secretions. And this may interfere with digestion of the food. And because they're older and they're slowing down, they can also suffer from decrease of peristalsis, which would increase their risk of having constipation. Let's talk a little bit about metabolism. Um, metabolism. Metabolism is, a, is the process in which the large molecules are broken down into smaller molecules. It makes energy available to the organism, and it also enables the absorption of nutrients to enter the body stream um, following digestion. One more thing I want to say about that. Digestion, what digestion does is it converts food into the chemical substance such as protein and simple sugars and this is what's used for energy for the body and cellular uh, metabolism. Now let's go ahead and start talking about the dietary guidelines. So we're going to move into this and this kind of is a little bit lengthy. There's different food groups and we're going to hit on all of them. So the first one I want to talk about is the milk group. Um, and so when it comes to milk, I understand that some people don't tolerate milk, some people don't like milk, and then we find other things that we could substitute it. For example, if the patient just doesn't like milk, then we may substitute pudding or cheese or yogurt for them. Um, or if they don't tolerate milk, we may, you know, give them something else for cal for calcium like broccoli. Um, as far as milk goes, we want them to have three servings a day, and this would provide calcium, protein, phosphorus, vitamin A and D, and riboflavin into their diet. For the meat group, this provides uh, calories, protein, iron, zinc, copper, and B-complex vitamins. And then we have the um, fatties and oil in the sweet group. And this includes, of course, fats, oils, sweets, um, salty snacks, alcohol, and other beverages, and condiments. And that group needs to be used very sparingly. I want you guys to please make sure that you turn to figure 26-2. Um, that has my um, plate food guidelines. You must, must, must know that. Okay, so look at that. Also, please view box. 26-1 and that is the American Heart Association diet and lifestyle recommendations. I need you to familiarize yourself with that. But I'm going to tell you a few things about it. The recommendations from America Heart Association and America Cancer Society um, directs and looks at an increased total carbohydrate ingestion with an emphasis on complex carbohydrates. So I need you to know that it has an increased total carbohydrate ingestion with an emphasis on complex carbohydrates. 
For example, another example, diabetic patients, uh, the complex carbs help them to maintain a more consistent blood level. And I also need you to know and um, remember that carbs are the main source of energy. Now those two um, recommendations, they also um, lean heavily on a reduced uh, cholesterol intake, reduced in the amount of fine sugars in a diet. Um, they lean heavily on eating a high fiber diet. Um, and I want you to know that eating an apple with the peel still on it is considered high fiber or more fiber. Um, they also lean on a decreased sodium intake. They want you to limit the use of salt cured uh, meats, smoked meats, and any char uh, charcoal broiled foods. Also to drink alcohol in moderation or none at all. To limit caffeine intake to no more than the equivalent of about four eight ounces of coffee a day um, and we need to really understand what eight ounces is a real cup because some people when they say one cup they're they're talking about like a cup you know like a cup but no we mean eight ounces um, six nutrients that are used by the body that must be supplied in adequate amounts from foods for normal functioning or are uh, protein, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, and water. One, two, three, four, five. Wait a minute, let me say it again. Proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, mineral, and water. There they are, that's the six. Um, and protein, protein uh, helps to rebuild cells and tissues and things like that. And sometimes if we have a patient who has very dry um, hair or falling hair, fall, hair falling out, we look at their protein intake, just so that you know. Um, carbohydrates is another one. Fats is one. Vitamins. Um, when we're teaching a patient about vitamin, we also teach them about um, exposure to the sunlight for about 10 to 15 minutes uh, every day can increase your vitamin D. So I need you to know that exposure to the sunlight for 10 to 15 minutes every day can increase your vitamin D. And then minerals and water. We need to make sure we get enough mineral intake and drink uh, enough water a day. Now, the dietary guidelines also have the food guide pyramid. And the food guide pyramid has a variety of foods in each group, um, and it is necessary for good nutrition. Now, we already started with some, and now we're going to um, round them out. So, we did not talk about the bread group yet. And the bread group consists of bread, cereal, rice, and pasta. And the recommended uh, servings amount for that are 6 to 11 servings per day for this particular group. The vegetable group, um, let me see here. The vegetable group, we want 3 to 5 servings per day. And that's of all vegetables, especially leafy greens. Uh, we already talked about the fruit group. The fruit group also does include fruit juices. We talked about the milk group. Yes, we did. Uh, we talked about the meat group already. And the group that's sparing. Now, um, let's talk about protein and why it's so important for us to have protein in our diet. Um, protein is a constant supply of what we call our essentials for rebuilding and replacing body tissues every day, all day. Um, and it is composed of amino acids. There are nine essentials, those which cannot be synthesized and which must then be acquired via the diet. And then there's 11 non-essentials and those are which the body can synthesize on its own. Now when we have a patient who um, have some illnesses or a patient who's had a surgery, injuries, burns, blood loss, uh, rapid growth, uh, pregnancy, or a lactating mom, these patients need more protein in their diet. Um, because of the production of um, production of cell walls and tissue rebuilding. P 
people on the other hand who have renal failure their um, renal disease makes it where they can only get like five ounces maximum of protein because they will end up with an excessive waste created by too much protein um, and then it will be excreted by the liver and the kidneys um, which is their renal system and they're in renal failure that's why they need very limited amounts the body will protect its own protein stores first by using carbohydrates then by burning fats for energy if these are already low if the carbohydrates and the fats are low then the body will use its dietary protein then it will go into tissue protein for energy the figured amount for protein need there is a way that we come up with that um, and it's basically the weight of a person divided by 2.2 uh, which would equal their kilograms and then you would do the kilograms times 0 0.8 and that will equal the grams of protein that that particular patient is needed per day I need you to know that uh, uh, conversion. I need you to know it and I need you to be able to do it. So I'm going to say it again. The weight will be divided by 2.2 um, which will equal what their kilograms are. Okay. And then you will take their kilograms and you will multiply that by 0 0.8 and then that will equal the grams of protein that that particular patient needs per day. Now when we're talking about the proteins, we're talking about meats, poultry, fish, dairy and uh, other products like soybeans now we also have what we call uh, those what I just named what we call complete proteins then we have what we call incomplete proteins and incomplete proteins are cereals grains lagoons and most vegetables and for the protein we make sure that we look at what we reference as the DRI the DRI is the dietary reference intake okay the DRI and the DRI basically tells us what the amount recommended is so one serving of protein is about three ounces of meat or a half cup of dry um, beans the DRI for protein may vary based on activity state of health and the ability to pro um, the, the av availability of the protein food source very active adults and athletes have to eat more protein because their bodies are burning it more readily. Uh, protein deficit in children uh, may uh, affect them devastatingly and they could have a lack of protein and that can cause permanent disabilities for those young children. And there are a couple of those disabilities that we see markedly. Um, and one is called Marasmus, and that is M-A-R-A-S-M-U-S. -S. And that is a form of protein deficiency and malnutrition that occurs chiefly in the first year of a baby's life. And it's characterized by growth, retardation, and wasting of subcutaneous fat and muscle. They can result in severe starvation. The body uses its fat and carbohydrates for um, energy, and when these are depleted, then protein muscle mass is used for energy after that. And the use of muscle mass for energy will result in heart, lung, and kidney damage if it continues with the patient. If it's uncorrected, it can lead to death in the child. And then we have Kawashkor, and that's K. W-A-S-H-I-O-R-K-O-R, -O -O and that differs from the one we just spoke about, and that there is adequate caloric intake, but insufficient protein intake. So some of those symptoms include edema, hair loss, pigment changes, impaired growth, and distension of the abdomen. Um, and liver changes. So you know how you see those pictures of those babies that um, have those big round um, abdomens um, when they're trying to ask you to give money to those areas to feed the children? That is that syndrome. Now there's also some protein excesses. 
And when we see that, it is very stressful for the liver and kidneys, and it increases the risk of obesity, heart disease, and certain types of cancers. Now, let's go ahead and move into certain diets, okay? So there's a lot of diets in the world. You guys understand that. There's a million different ways that people eat. So we're going to only touch on a few that you may see often. One, uh, what they were going to talk about is the vegetarian diet. And there's several. That's the lacto-ovo vegetarian. There's the lacto-vegetarian. And there's the vegan. Okay, so the lacto-ovo vegetarian, they will eat dairy products and eggs as well as their plant-based foods. For the lacto-vegetarian, they um, do not eat eggs and they do not eat dietary products. And the vegan diet, all animal resources are excluded from their diet. Now for the vegetarians, they um, their meals are very well planned and vegetarians differ um, their diets differ and they will have some very good health benefits when done correctly and some very poor benefits when done inadequately uh, for one a positive thing will it decreases the risk of heart disease and hypertension diabetes and obesity vegans may have a deficit though in their diet and they can have deficits in their b vitamins like b6 b12 iron zinc riboflavin and vitamin d now one thing i want you guys to make a note of and um highlight this for me is that the challenge is to plan meals that offer complete proteins vitamins and minerals Make a note of that and make a note of where B12 is stored. And I want you to know B12 is stored in the stomach. Also, for um, our plant source eaters, make sure that you know that um, all amino acids from plant source, they can come from soybeans. And also make a note that vegans are also at risk for iron deficiency. All right, now let's move on to carbohydrates. As you know, in America, we eat way, way too many carbohydrates. Um, but carbohydrates are the body's main source of energy. Uh, but I need you to make sure that you make a note of uh, carbohydrates each gram supplies about four calories each gram supplies four calories and I want you to know that there are three main types of carbohydrates there's the simple there's the complex and there's the fiber when I talk about simple I'm talking about uh, carbohydrates such as table sugar which is sucrose fruit sugar which is fructose and milk sugar, which is lactulose. Now, simple sugars are quickly absorbed into the bloodstream. And so that means that they will raise your blood glucose very fast. And then that would make your uh, sugar levels fall quickly as well, making you feel hungry again very fast. So if you have a patient or you are trying to lose weight, you need to stay away from those simple sugars. Stay away from sucrose, which is table sugar, fructose, fruit sugar, and lactulose, which is milk sugar. And I need you to know, if I say sucrose, I need you to know what that is. If I say lactulose, I need you to know what that is. If I say fructose, I need you to know what that is, okay? Now let's move on to complex carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates are things like um, uh, breads, pasta, cereal, rice, and potatoes. They're broken down into sugar, uh, simple sugars for digestion for the use of the body. And it provides more of a constant serum glucose level than the simple sugars provide. And let's move on to the last carbohydrate, which is fiber. 
Fiber increases bulk in the stool and it also delays cholesterol and carbohydrate con uh, consumption. Increased fiber may substitute, um, increasing your fiber, you can do something as easily as substitute whole wheat bread for white bread, whole wheat pasta for white pasta. Um, also, there are some cereals on the market that have a lot of fiber in it. Also, like all bran, like Fiber One, things like that. We're supposed to have about 13 to 14 grams for about one cup. And here in America, we do not get enough fiber in our diet. Um, and also, beans are another good uh, source of fiber. When it comes to fiber, there's two types of fiber. There's the uh, soluble fiber and there's the insoluble fiber. So insoluble fiber tends to be crunchy fiber and soluble tends to be gummy or mushy like um, beans or oatmeal or applesauce. Now, let's get into some examples of fiber-containing foods. We already spoke of one, which was a fruit, which was the um, apple with the peel on. And also, you have bananas, oranges, grapefruit, cantaloupe, strawberries. Um, other high-fiber-containing foods can be vegetables like leafy greens, broccoli, green beans, cauliflower, celery, um, corn, and potatoes with the um, skin on or in sweet potatoes as well grains and cereal like we discussed that is some fiber um, certain brands like all brand or fiber one uh, shredded wheat oatmeal and like I said some breads or grains and then cooked legumes like like beans like kidney beans pinto beans uh, lima beans uh, navy beans, and black eyed peas. All right, so let's talk a little bit about fats. Uh, we must have fats in our diet. I know that sometimes there's like this whole thing of, oh, if you wanna lose weight, you know, like, don't eat fats in your diet. You need fats in your diet. They're essential nutrients. Um, they supply a concentration form of energy, and they spare your protein from being burned as energy and they supply about nine calories per gram they add flavor to your food and they dissolve and transport fat soluble vitamins and they make food taste better a lot of times and they're cushioning and it protects the body and it also gives you a feeling of fullness fats are made up of fatty acids and um, glycerol fatty acids are concentrated as saturated or unsaturated uh, and the way to know the oils uh, part is fatty liquids at room temperature. We call them oils. And oils contain unsaturated fat. Unsaturated fat. And oils are like corn oil, safflower oil, canola oil, olive oil, 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 oil. Solid fats are called shortening or lard. Um, and you must realize that fat Fatty acids are necessary for maintaining well-being, okay, in all animals. It maintains the functioning and the in, uh, integrity of cells, and it helps to also regulate cell metabolism. Now, I want to talk about two different types of cholesterol. There's two. There's the LDL, and then there's the HDL. And the HDL is what we call the good cholesterol. It's high uh, density. And the LDL is the one that they call the not so good, like the bad cholesterol. And um, so we try to stay away from as much of that as possible. Now, one of the things, uh, one of there's several reasons why America's obesity rates continue to rise. But one of the reasons is that um, we have too many sometimes uh, fats in our diet. We normally average about one third to one half of our calories um, are of fats, which is way too much. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's the difference between fat and cholesterol. Fats from plant sources 
contain no cholesterol. Cholesterol is found only in animal uh, sources of fat and it contains no calories. So when I say that, I want you to be able to make the difference in certain foods that we would say is high in cholesterol and foods that we would say is low in cholesterol. So if I was to give you a choice in a dinner meat, I would say you need to pick the one that is um, that has reduced cholesterol and I give you a choice of tuna that is in um, canned water or chicken with the skin on even if it's baked then which one has the reduced cholesterol and the answer to that is the tuna cholesterol is linked to heart disease and arthrosclerosis and arteriosclerosis is hardening of the arteries cholesterol is essential for structures of some hormones and conversion of vitamin D and for production of bile in the liver so we need it we need some of it we just don't need as much as we consume um, omega-3 fatty acids um, that is the most unsaturated form of fatty acid and we can find that in uh, salmon habit sardines tuna uh, canola oil soybean oil um, chicken eggs and walnuts and all of these things should be added to the diet as sources of unsaturated fat there's also a table on 26-2 that shows you uh, food sources of fat. Don't want to tell you that. Yeah, let's clarify. Animal food sources for most saturated fatty acid, that's where you're going to find that, and vegetables, nuts, and seeds supply unsaturated fatty acids. So animal sources are saturated fatty acids. Vegetables, nuts, and seeds are unsaturated fatty acids. And there are uh, three essential fatty acids that are found in canola um, oil, safflower oil, and sunflower oil. The recommended allowance uh, for fatty acids make up more than 25 to 30 percent of your total caloric intake okay let's move on to the vitamins and minerals so uh, hold on a second here I'm going to talk about the two different vitamins we have the fat soluble vitamins and then we have the water soluble vitamins so vitamin A D E and K can be stored in the body it is considered fat soluble vitamins and in excessive amounts they can become toxic to your body now the water soluble vitamins they absorb then they're excreted from the fluids of your body which means that you will urinate them out mostly and these vitamins are B complex vitamins like thiamine riboflavin niacin vitamin B6 vitamin B12 folic acid um, pentonic acid and biotin and also vitamin C and I also want you to know that vitamin C helps your body against infections and it aids in wound healing um, as well so patients who have had surgeries uh, things like that you may notice that they may have a uh, citrus um, tomatoes green leafy vegetables things like that on their trays to help promote healing please view table 26-4 for that um, and now let's talk about minerals minerals function as building material and we need minerals in our diet and unfortunately that's something that we lack as well in our current American diet um, we have very decreased amounts um, Minerals are used for bone, bony tissue. So we have like calcium, phosphorus. Those are for bones and teeth. Those are minerals. 
phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and um, chloride. Those are used for soft body tissues. And then we have iron and copper. Iron goes to your uh, HBG and copper is for your RBCs, so for your blood. And then we have granular excretions. Um, and chlorine is in that, and that is for our gastric juices. We have sodium in our intestinal juices and iodine in thiamine. Minerals are inorganic substances, and it, con it is contained in animal and plant products, and it is essential to uh, metabolism and cellular function. And you will see that they will normally categorize them as major minerals or trace minerals. So some major minerals are calcium, magnesium, sodium, uh, potassium, phosphorus, sulfate, and chlorine. That's what we call major minerals. Now trace minerals um, are things like iron, copper, iodine, magnesium, cobalt, zinc, um, psyllium, fluoride, and chromium. Patients who have iron deficiencies or like our, um, our patients that are anemic, we will increase their iron in their diet. And by doing that, we may give them dietary things such as liver, red meat, dark leafy greens, fortified cereal, legumes, or whole grains. And there are other functions for these minerals as well. And that includes maintaining rigidity in the teeth and the bones, facilitating contractions of the muscles, and assisting in blood clotting and tissue repair and growth. There are a lot of factors that deal with uh, influencing nutrition, and the ones that I wanna talk about right now is age. So there's different factors for influences dealing with age, such as infants. They're inf the infants, they depend solely, their nutritional needs are solely dependent on other people. So whatever you feed them is what they're gonna have, what they're gonna intake. Children, on the other hand, they need nutrition based on their stage of development. Adolescents, their nutrition is sometimes based on their uh, influence by the peers. Um, and when I say that, I mean not like they're peer pressured, but like if their friends are eating something that they like or they're hanging out with their friends and they're all going to go to Whataburger, then those are the kind of things where I'm saying influenced by their friends. So they may have a heavy dependence on fast food. Eating disorders such as anemia and um, an, uh, anorexia nervosa and bulimia may also occur during this period. And it could go into their um, adulthood as well. Elderlies, their uh, influences on nutrition can sometimes deal with psychological changes, physical limitations, um, the difficulty obtaining or preparing their food. And then we have patients who have different illnesses. And their illnesses, they may need different nutritional um, things. Um, their needs may be based on what their illness is, okay? And we have some patients who have cancers or uh, HIV. Um, they tend to need things that would help reduce the risk of cancers, um, such as things that may be high in antioxidants like blueberries, strawberries, raspberries. So I want you to know that um, patients who may have illnesses or cancers or HIV, they may need to eat uh, more of the blueberries, strawberries, and raspberries. Now, patients who drink a lot of alcohol, I want you to make a note of this as well. They will almost always have a decrease in their thiamine. So they could have thiamine deficits. Other factors that influence nutrition is emotional status. Some persons overeat at times of stress, but then you do have other people who at times of stress, they will not eat. They will decrease their caloric intake um, for stress or if they are battling with depression.
Then we have economic status. Um, income can greatly impact what food choices you can um, obtain or if you are able to obtain food at all. Then we have some religion factors that influence nutrition like the uh, like Islam or um, some Muslim uh, they will not have any pork or no alcohol uh, for Judaism um, kosher preparation of all their food is a must they will not eat any pork they will not eat any shellfish and they will make a note of this part though for Judaism they will not have milk and meat in the same meal make sure you know that now let's talk about some cultural um cultural like um um african americans like you will notice oh oh let me go back let me go let me go back let me go back to uh religion one more time uh seven day adventists they will not have any stimulants or shellfish or pork or uh, alcohol and when i say stimulants i mean things like uh caffeine now let's talk about cultural um, African Americans, you will often um, see that they follow a southeastern United States diet where they may have um, vegetables like okra and black eyed peas, and they are uh, variances of greens like leafy greens like kale and mustards and collards and uh, turnips. They will have a diet that may be high in beans, uh, sweet potatoes, pork, certain type of fish. Um, and chicken and unfortunately some of these meats are fried for the Hispanic culture um, their diet may be very high in carbohydrates so things like um, that they will also have are beans and rice and uh, tortillas and their meat uh, dishes may be heavily seasoned or very spicy and the high fat content um, are normally from them using lard and food preparation. Um, as far as the desserts go, for a lot of people in the Hispanic um, culture, those sauces that they put on their desserts tend to be very syrupy and sweet. For Asian Americans, um, I want you to make a note of this. Their diet may be very high in sodium. Make a note of that. Um, also, traditionally, they're high in carbohydrates and vegetables, but very low in meat and fish. And their vegetables are usually not eaten raw. They also do have beans in their diet, such as sprouts and tofu, or which we call soy. And for the Middle Eastern cultures, we notice that they do not have any pork in their diet. You can see some of these um, variances of cultures on table 26-7. Now I want to get a little bit into the water intake. We don't drink enough water. I don't drink enough water. I'm trying to drink water today. Like we just don't drink enough water and we really need more water in our diet. Water is the most essential of all the nutrients. Our bodies are made up about 50 to 69 percent water and water requires a uh, requirement is about one milliliter of calorie of intake we don't get that we don't drink enough water is used for every process in your body every single one okay so now i'm going to move on to nutritional needs uh through the lifespan okay let's start with the infants of course so infants uh, they should double their weight by six months of age and they should triple their weight by one year of age uh, breast milk is what we recommend for uh, babies up to one year of age uh, but we do understand that sometimes it can't be done uh, but it is it is just the recommendations and we say that solid food should um, be introduced into their diet at about four to six months um, and when we say solid foods the first solid food that an infant normally can tolerate is rice cereal please make a note of that Um, and for the babies that cannot breastfeed till one year of age, um, infant formula is similar or it is formulated after breast milk. Now for toddlers, toddlers are normally from the age of two to five years of 
uh, age and they should consume less milk and they should be increasing their solid intake at that time. When we're dealing with um, infants and toddlers, we do a lot of parent teaching and parent guidelines uh, just for support for them, to teach them ways to get their children to eat, because you know sometimes that's a battle. Uh, we tell them to make sure that meal time is pleasant, uh, the environment is pleasant, avoid um, what do we call them when we mix foods together, like casseroles? Avoid casseroles because they don't really tolerate that well. They don't like it. Um, one item at a time is more enticing to toddlers. Uh, so make a note of that. One item at a time is more enticing to toddlers. Uh, we make sure that they have proper sized plates. Don't feed them on no huge plate. It looks overwhelming to them. And then sometimes that makes us teach them to overeat. And then they also need proper size utensils. We use colorful plates to them because you know when things are pleasing to the eye, you're more likely to eat. They're no different than everybody else. And we offer foods that are easy for them to chew and foods that are very colorful like carrots and peas, things like that. Now for school age children, this is when we start noticing that they have this huge desire for sweets, um, which we do have to really pay attention to. Um, and they are also influenced by their peer groups. And they are very susceptible to commercials and food that they see on commercials. Um, school age children should be served a nutritional breakfast before school. It helps them to concentrate better. And we also know that diets that are high in calorie, high in sodium, and high in sugar is what is increasing our childhood obesity rates. It makes them predisposed to obesity. Now let's talk a little bit about the adolescents. The adolescents, uh, for their nutritional needs, for that portion of your lifespan, now they will consume some fast food because there is easy for them to get, you know, and things like that. But they do require vitamins and increased iron uh, because of them growing. And they have concerns over appearance, and sometimes that leads to some of the uh, adolescents having eating disorders. Adolescents also have growth spurts and some physiological changes that occur during that time, things such as puberty, and this will increase their caloric need and their nutritional requirements at that time. We tell parents that, you know, if they get concerned about their uh, adolescent snacking, sometimes if you provide things for them to snack on, they will snack on those things, like things that are high in calcium, high in protein, high in iron, because we want to decrease foods that are high in fat. And then we do have to teach them at that time about healthier choices because they're not always with you and they're gone with their friends and so they do need to know what healthier choices are. We still keep fruit juice for them as well and low fat milk. They do not need whole milk at all. It has too much sugar in it. Um, and also they will snack on um, veggie sticks or like cut up fruit, things like that. They really will. Now let's move into adults. Unfortunately, adults are relying on too much fast food, which is increasing our um, obesity rates as well. And it also um, increases our hypertension prevalence. Um, adults tend to have increased amounts of fat and sodium in their diet and sugar. And they have uh, what we call sedentary lifestyles or, you know, they don't get enough exercise. So for adults... We like to teach them about these prevalences for obesity and hypertension and what their dietary recommendations are and that we would like to decrease their sodium intake and their simple sugar intake and increase things like fruit and vegetables like we just really don't get enough of that in and to prepare more meals at home and to increase your water intake. Now for elderly adults, things kind of vary a little bit for them. They're mostly at risk for inadequate nutrition. Their eating habits are very highly influenced by economic status, their physical disabilities, any chronic diseases that they may have, and access to food sources. Many of them as well will consume more sweets. They just like it and they will overconsume them. 
um, they often will need to get nutritional help from like community services like uh, Meals on Wheels, food stamps, uh, food banks. Some churches um, have availability for this as well. Now, when we're talking about the nursing pro process, when we're dealing with nutrition, um, we must do full assessments. And that assessment must include a medical assessment, their family and their social history assessment. And also we want to get their body mass index. Um, and you can see that on figure 26-5. And when we say body mass index, you may also see that referred to as BMI. The BMI should be between 18.5 and 24.9. Now, um, there is a uh, configuration that we use when we're calculating the BMI. We multiply the weight in pounds by 700, 705. Then we divide that uh, figure by the square of their height in inches. I want you to take a, a good look also at the purple header review on assessment of nutrition. I want you to know what the signs of malnutrition is, okay? I want you to know what a protein deficiency looks like. And I want you to know what excessive sugar looks like on assessment. For example, if you have a patient who has a protein deficit, you may see thin dry hair as a result of that. And when we're talking about assessment of a patient who may be um, consuming excessive amount of sugars, we may look in their mouth at their teeth for dental caries or missing teeth. Some nursing diagnoses that we use for nutrition are imbalanced nutrition. It could be less than body requirement or more than body requirement. An effective coping is another one that you'll see. A deficit or excessive fluid volume. You may also see delayed growth and development. And one that we see and we use a lot is knowledge deficit. Um, in some elderly uh, patients, you may see diagnoses as impaired swallowing and or risk for aspiration. When it comes to planning for these patients, we need to plan both long-term and short-term goals for them. And we have to make sure that all goals are measurable. You need to know that across the board. Anytime we're making goals, they must be measurable. And then for the implementation, we use things as preparing the patient for a meal as an implementation, meal tray setup as an implementation, checking the diet order as one, and patient teaching plan for nutrition. And then of course, the last phase, which is evaluation, we have expected outcomes and have they been achieved or not. So I brought in a few of my little fake trays, guys, so I can teach you what some of these diets look like in picture form. This is what I consider a bland diet. You see that? Here's one of my diabetic diets. That would be considered a 2,000 calorie diet. You see that? I have another diabetic diet I want to show you. This is considered a diabetic diet also. And that's probably more on the uh, terms of an 1800 calorie diabetic diet. Now this right here, remember we just talked about renal diets. This is a renal diet tray that you may see. We talked about that. Yeah. And then I want to talk about a cardiac or a heart healthy diet. A cardiac or a heart healthy diet might look like this or like this. 
Now let's talk about a um, diet that may be high in, um, that's another one. Let's talk about a diet that may be um, a high fiber diet. This is considered a high fiber diet. That right there. This also is considered a high fiber diet. Now let's move on to what I consider a regular diet. You may see this on a regular diet. That's a regular diet tray or something that may look more on the lines of this. It's a regular diet breakfast tray. This right here is what we would consider a pureed diet. And then here's a full liquid diet. That basically means anything that's liquid at room temperature. Full liquid diet. And then we have a clear liquid diet. I also had So those are all the diets that I wanted to show you, you know, so that you guys can kind of get an idea of some trays that you may see, um, you know, just so that you can have an idea, okay? So that's the end of that unit. Uh, that is chapter 26.